full of mysteries and surprises, the ancient routes through Central Asia still exist, like the adventurous road through the Pamir Mountains to the roof of the world. Pamir Highway was completed in 1932 as a gift from the Soviet state to its remote regions. Travelling along it today is to rediscover a route steeped in legend. Home to peaks well over 7,000 meters high and enclosed by China, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan and Afghanistan, the Pamir lies in the heart of Central Asia. Our journey along the Pamir Highway begins in Dushanbe, the capital of Tajikistan. It will take us along the river Panj, which forms the border with Afghanistan, through the Wakhan Corridor, then 1,300 kilometers on to Osh. Our final destination is Bishkek, the capital of Kyrgyzstan. Dushanbe means Monday. A century ago, this was still an insignificant hamlet. It was only during the Soviet era that Dushanbe developed into a city. When Tajikistan gained independence in 1991, Dushanbe became the country's capital. After a long civil war, this young nation is again fostering the oriental traditions of Central Asia. The wisdom and learning of the East are assuming importance once more. The grandiose government buildings in the Tajik capital stand out through a wealth of oriental ornamentation. The visitor feels that he has arrived in some splendid Central Asian metropolis. Yet despite all the splendor on display, Tajikistan is still one of the world's poorest countries. In order to feed their families, most of the men have to find jobs in Russia as guest workers. Yet there is still an upper class which celebrates parties here. Located near the young capital Dushanbe are ancient excavation sites like Hisar, where finds date back over 3,000 years to prehistoric times. This region was settled even in the Stone Age. Before the Bolsheviks occupied this region of Central Asia for the Soviet Union, this fortress was part of the sphere of influence of the Emir of Bukhara, a powerful feudal ruler at the time. Today, these sites in Tajikistan are cultivated, protected by UNESCO, and presented to visitors with pride. Barely 60 years old, Dushanbe is a young city. The architecture reflects the Soviet era, with broad streets, green zones and avenues. 90% of the population are Sunni Muslims, but many Western faces and styles are also seen on the streets of Dushanbe. Roxana, the wife of Alexander the Great, was a Tajik. It was she who established the reputation women here have of being exceptionally beautiful and self-confident. In Dushanbe, we made the acquaintance of Parvina, a young woman who deals in Tajik works of art. Parvina supplies international trade fairs and local businesses. My name is Parvina. I am actually uh, from Pamir, but I'm living here in Tajikistan. I'm working with uh, Pamir handmade products, 
which we are making, uh, we are as a community based in uh, Tajikistan and uh, we do this type of handmade stuff. So this is a, a special hat, this is handmade and this embroidery is also made handmade. So you can see how does it looks. And uh, so this is what uh, actually uh, our national coal cup, which we do. The owner of the store is chatting to Bavina in Tajik, a variety of Persian. Our country is really Muslim country, but it's uh, uh, by geographic uh, information, it's 95 percent of uh, Muslim and five percent, let's say, uh, some Christian, some less of them Catholic. So uh, that's it. But at all, uh, our Muslims are also free. They can freely uh, choose what they want to wear. They educate it. Only it depends on the family. It depends on the family uh, and uh, the, the parents, what they're going to teach uh, the children what to wear. And actually, this is free. Nobody, not government, not uh, religion, uh, push you to wear what, what you should. You, you, you can choose. You have a free freedom, you can choose what you're wearing, how uh, you, you're going to live your life. We leave Dushanbe and begin our journey on the Pamir Highway along the border with Afghanistan. The road is used by powerful Chinese trucks, returning to China with minerals after having brought in cheap goods to flood the local market. The highway soon follows the Panj River, the natural border between Tajikistan and Afghanistan. Afghan villages are visible on the far bank. Driving is a challenge, and the big trucks don't exactly improve the condition of the road. In Korog, we visit the Aga Khan Foundation to learn more about the state of this mountain region. The manager responsible for it is Kishwa Abdulisha, and he's happy to provide us with information. For sure, you know, like Tajikistan as a very young, you know, like, uh, which got independence just very recently from the Soviet Union. And in, as part of Soviet Union, we were dependent on the other republics of the Soviet Union, economically, you know, like socially. And uh, as all those, uh, you know, links, relationships, particularly economic uh, links are cut now, you know, we have to reestablish everything. So we have to build roads, we have to, you know, like improve the, you know, you know, you know, like the communication systems, we have to build a lot of bridges, we have to revive the agriculture sector, we have to revive, you know, like the tourism sector, the industrial sector, but you know, the good news is there, there is progress. Before reaching the Pamir, we visit a place people here are particularly proud of. The hot springs of Garm Chashma are said to have healing properties that help cure skin diseases and other health problems. Men and women alternately bathe here. Since bathers wear hardly any clothes, we were not allowed to film. After all, this is a Muslim country. Garm Chashma is 2,500 meters above sea level. The place is a reminder that even the mountains bordering the roof of the world are geologically very young and still not at rest. The landscape is barren. It is only along the rivers that people have settled, planted trees and grown rice. Young men are a rare sight. It is mainly the elderly and women with children who live on the farms. We heard of an old man here who still makes and plays Central Asian instruments in the traditional way. Ever since Chinese goods began to flood Central Asia, it is a handicraft that has become rare and, from a commercial point of view, is now hardly worthwhile. Masain Masainov represented the culture of the Tajiks in the Pamir even during the days of the Soviet Union. He learned the art from his father. Masainov was once also the local village schoolmaster. 
His instruments are fashioned with gouges, files, and other basic carpentry tools. Inside the house, the maestro showed us finished instruments from his collection and told us about his profession. To make musical instruments, you need unusually strong wood, wood that won't splinter or break. That is why most of our traditional instruments are made from the wood of trees that bear fruit. The most suitable type of wood comes from the mulberry tree. It hardly ever splinters. So it is especially suitable for making the rhubarb, which the Pamiri play. We don't buy any wood from other countries. We are offered good wood in places like Korob. We examine it, buy it and bring it here. Only wood from this region is suitable. It's strong and resistant. It doesn't crack, and since it hardly rots, it preserves its quality for a long time. The maestro fashions his instruments in a highly personal style. These unique specimens have no need to fear mass-produced goods. The impressions made by the few villages along the route are all similar. Lots of small homesteads with fruit and vegetable gardens and a few domestic animals. Only women and children are to be seen. When we ask about the menfolk, the answer is virtually the same everywhere. They've left to work abroad. They send money, the women say, but rarely come home. There is virtually no other source of income. By chance, we spotted a group of women who meet to do handicraft work together. <laughs> they embroider, crochet, braid, and sew in Pamiri style. The women are colorfully dressed and feel at ease with strangers. They make their products for traders who sell them in the towns or even abroad. The women also come together for company and to chat about everyday matters. The house belongs to Katamalieva Tiramo, who tells us about the tradition. My mother taught me the handicraft of the Pamiri as a child so that I would always have a profession and be able to support myself. Today I do this work out of a sense of tradition. I'm passing my skills on to the next generation. Mrs. Tiramo told us about a temple the women visit regularly. This aroused our curiosity, and so we followed behind the small group in their colourful garments. We soon noticed that the building in question was not a mosque. You would never see horned sheep or goats in a mosque, more likely on Buddhist Mani walls or an ancient cultic site. A huge set of ram's horns adorn the roof, and the horns of various animals can also be found in the interior of the freshly renovated temple. The women have brought gifts which they place in the temple for other visitors who might perhaps be hungry. This, we were told, is a place that dates back to a Sufi saint who lived in pre-Islamic days. <laughs> Inside the temple, the women are now circling the altar, which is also adorned with animal horn relics. A cult that presumably goes back to the fire cult of the followers of Zarathustra. This fits in with the Persian influence on the culture of the Pamir. But what is astonishing, and at the same time wonderful, is that these traditional customs are practiced and tolerated so openly. The scenery is getting more and more beautiful. Ahead of us lies the Wakan Corridor. The ruins of ancient fortresses testify to the importance of this historic route. Over 7,000 meters high, the mountains bear names like Marks, 
Engels, or communism. That is how the old Soviet Union honored its highest places. Belonging to the old Eastern Bloc saved these landscapes from mass tourism and has enabled so much to be preserved. In the villages along the Pamir Highway, visitors can find accommodation with families in what are known as homestays. We're spending the night with the Malik Mamadov family. The daughter of the house is getting our sleep quarters ready. It's perfectly natural for travelers to participate in the domestic activities of the guest family. It's a way of making contact. The meals are basic, but tasty. During the daytime, the cooking is done outside. As master of the house, Malik makes sure everything is clean and hygienic. Several women from the village have gathered in the courtyard. They're putting down tufts of dyed sheep's wool and carefully watering them. The colors are strikingly bright, beautiful and vibrant. This looks like a social activity. There are no definite rules or patterns. Everything seems improvised. But making felt carpets has tradition here. Meanwhile, inside the house, the cooking continues. At altitude, guests love lots of liquid. In other words, tasty soups with vegetables and rich cheese. Our host, Malik Mamadov, lends a hand and explains the homestay principle to us. Here in the Pamir, the concept of the homestay or guest house taking in travelers, in other words, tourists, and catering for them was something totally new. Inviting outsiders like you into private homes and families and accepting them is something we first had to learn. Homestays are totally different from hotels because as long as guests stay, they live in the care and protection of the family. They are alone with the family and live in exactly the same way as a normal family in the Pamir. We try to show guests traditional Tajik hospitality in line with our traditions. We accept them as private people and treat them as such. What Malik doesn't mention is the low price which travelers pay for clean beds, good food and hospitality. And it's wonderful and special for all involved when, as a traveler, you can experience something new. Like seeing how a felt carpet is made by hand. Calmly and skillfully, without machinery, chemicals or tools. But Malik knows full well that life for the women and their families is not easy. The only problem we have in the villages, although it is a serious one, is the lack of infrastructure. Everything is so far away, and any jobs at all are poorly paid. There are no factories or other production facilities. That is why young people don't stay. They try to find at least temporary employment elsewhere. They also look for work abroad, but they do come back. Over the last 15 years, a lot of things have improved, but by no means everything. Here, too, people find different ways of earning money. 
It's really good if handicraft products from the Pamiya can be sold directly to travelers without a middleman. In our case, like traditional carpets made from the wool from our own animals. Otherwise, people have to find different skills and talents for tackling their economic problems. Had it not been for our host, we would probably never have heard about the celebrations taking place the next morning. As it is, however, we've been invited to attend a festival organized by the Ismaili community. Everyone has turned up. The old men sit together or engage in traditional games. The colorfully dressed women and children are enjoying the cheerful atmosphere. Young men and children are dancing. Young girls and older women, too, are moving around in public totally relaxed. Each in her own way has made herself pretty. The children, too, are all spruced up. Ismailis usually live in the mountain regions of Central Asia and are regarded as a cosmopolitan branch of Shiite Islam. The villagers have gathered here to celebrate the anniversary of the assumption of office of the fourth Aga Khan, the leader of the 15 million Ismailis worldwide. The atmosphere here is so peaceful, colorful, open and pleasant that we stayed far longer than we intended. The Pamir Highway now traverses passes over 4,000 meters high constantly providing us with changing impressions and enchanting moods. Rugged cliffs alternate with the passage of white clouds. The Bactrian camels on the other side of the river are in Afghanistan. The Russian invasion of that crisis-ridden country is said to have started from here. The region was always of interest to armies, drug smugglers and spies. But it has always attracted friends of the mountains and nature enthusiasts as well. They love and respect the special atmosphere of the Pamir region with its views of the Hindu Kush and Wakan. Tajikistan is famous for its idyllic mountain lakes at high altitude. Geologists, ornithologists and archaeologists find a true El Dorado here. The members of one expedition, which by chance sought refuge in this cave 4,200 meters above sea level, discovered Stone Age paintings. Red mineral pigment was used for ritual images. Today, we no longer know what they represent. What is certain, however, is that human beings settled here several thousand years ago. Mukhab is a border town 3,600 meters above sea level in the high Pamir. For its 7,000 inhabitants, this is life at the limits. Mukhab lies at the same altitude as Lhasa, the capital of Tibet. Heavy trucks speed towards China along the dusty Pamir highway. Hardly any of them stop to refuel or spend the night here. Tajiks wearing hats and children at play are very much part of the street scene in Mugab. The crescent over the mosque and prayer chains in the hands of the elderly are the prevailing impressions. The town also has a garrison, which we're not allowed to film and a market. The market stalls are set up in steel containers so that goods can also be sold in winter when the temperature can easily drop to more than 40 below. Living conditions here seem to be right on the edge of what is tolerable and economic prospects are virtually non-existent. We found one young lady who was prepared to talk to us. We don't have jobs, we don't have factory or something. Uh, we have only old people here, the youngest people, they leave us uh, because we don't have jobs. And we don't have university to study. 
we have only high schools and they they go to other cities and other countries to study. Me too. From Murgab, the third highest peak in the Pamir, the Mustak Atta is visible. It lies in China. And China is what a lot of young people here have their sights set on. I want to go to Guangzhou. Then first I want to learn the language, uh, because uh, the first learn uh, Chinese language to easy there. Then I want to go to Shanghai, then Beijing, then from there. It's uh, easy for us. It's easy for us. A visa is not too hard to get. Whether Lenin would have liked that, in Murgab, they have at least left his statue standing. But there again, you never know what the future holds. Anyone driving along the Pamir Highway experiences only part of the beauties of this comparatively unknown mountain region. Many of the tours and trekking routes that start here have to be experienced on foot. We travel on towards Kyrgyzstan. The passes are getting higher and higher, and the living conditions even more extreme. Here, families with their animals still climb to the summer pastures well over 4,500 meters above sea level. In winter, the clans that spend the summer up here live 2,000 meters further down, with television and the internet. Up here, life has remained unchanged. At this altitude, only yaks and goats are the only livestock that can survive. Their dung is collected and dried, a vital and time-consuming task. But the fuel is essential for heating the yurts, for cooking and for heating milk. In mountain regions like this, there are simply no alternatives. While the herds are still grazing on the pastures, the women attend to a large number of jobs. The sun can be powerful at altitude. Then the work is done inside the yurts. Today, ropes are being braided from yak hair. Good ropes are still needed for securing the yurts and fastening loads on yaks or trucks. What is more, quality ropes made from yak hair fetch top prices. The women enjoy their work and chat together in Kyrgyz. We're still in Tajikistan, but nomadic people who live here usually have Kyrgyz roots. <laughs> the older women went to school in the days of the former Soviet Union. Back then, the attempt was made to domesticate the nomads and have them work on collective farms. Now it is again worthwhile moving up to the mountain pastures as a family to produce meat, dairy products and materials made from animal hair and hide. The work is hard. Apsamanova Asilkan tells us about it in Russian. When we roam here in summer with our livestock, we milk the animals and heat the milk on our stoves. Then we beat it and separate the fat, which is then used to make sour cream. The next step is to pack the sour cream in porous sacks and hang them up overnight. By morning, all the water has drained out of the sacks and the sour cream inside is dry. We then use the sour cream to make our famous cheese balls, which are known here as kurut. They will keep in storage for quite a while. That is a lot of work in one day for us women. But it has to be done because when the livestock return in the evening, there is fresh milk again. In the evening, the women keep their eyes open for the animals and their shepherds. The livestock has been out and about all day long, feeding on the last patches of grass on the mountain pastures. The animals arrive punctually and make for the yurts where their calves are waiting. They sense that their offspring are hungry and need to be fed. The 
the nomads make use of the situation to tether their animals. The yaks offer no resistance. After all, their young are close by. This proximity stimulates lactation, and the women start to milk the cows. The size of the animals doesn't worry them, again because the nearness of the calves keeps the mothers calm. The noise is deafening and makes it perfectly clear just why yaks are also known as grunting oxen. The calves are waiting to be suckled. Sometimes a youngster is allowed a brief sip from its mother's udder. This makes the cow then easier to milk. The yaks don't seem to notice whether a calf is drinking or they are being milked. The mere proximity of the calves keeps them quiet. A lot of animals have to be attended to in a short space of time. This is only possible because of the trust that exists between the milkmaids and their husbands, and also their sons, who show great skill in handling the animals. Up here it gets dark and bitterly cold very quickly. The yak milk is carefully collected in cans. After all, it is the raw material for cheese production. When the cows have been milked, the calves are allowed to drink the rest. Their behavior towards their patient mothers is not exactly considerate. Before the sun disappears completely, the herds of goats also return from the slopes of the highest mountains. They have to be kept in enclosures with high stone walls. Wolves lie in wait for stray animals, and they feel more confident taking on a goat than a yak. At dawn, the animals leave the camp again to spend the whole day searching for food on the surrounding high pastures. They've already been milked once again. The long working day of the families on the summer pastures at a height of 4,500 meters begins with the first rays of sunlight. The mountain pasture is no Kolkots. The area and the pasturage are shared by several families. But each family has its own animals and thus its own yields with regard to milk and cheese production. The sour cream, which is now drained, is placed in handy portions on something akin to a baking tray and air dried in the sun. What looks idyllic is hard work in thin air, in bitter cold in the morning, in hot weather at midday, and in dusty wind in the afternoon. Yes, of course we miss a few things up here, like uninterrupted power supply. I come from Morgab. In the early 90s, I moved to Karakul, where they had electricity. In Soviet days, the power supply in the towns and villages was good. Up here, we only have electricity in the evening. Then our solar batteries provide what they have stored during the day. Before that, we had lamps or torches. We're happy to have had solar cells for a few years now. The men and women from the various families share the heavy work. The pasteurization process is prepared in large vats. If certain bacteria are not killed off, the cheese won't keep, nor will it be tasty. The products from the mountain pastures are very much in demand and sell well. That is because the animals feed only on the finest grass and upland herbs. What is more, no chemicals or other foreign substances are added to the milk and the cheese. In order to pasteurize the whey, it's vital for the vat with the mixture of cheese and milk to be heated up with yak dung, but only briefly. And it must never boil. Such scenes are reminiscent of the books of Chinggis Aitmatov. 
I know Ait Matov's book from my childhood in the Soviet Union. We had readings and the books were free. I loved his book, Jamilia, but also Akimeni and Gusarat. They are wonderful stories. I can't remember the names of other works by him. It's too long ago. But Ait Matov became really famous. He made our way of life well known. He told nomad stories in other countries too. That's all I know about Ait Matov. <laughs> A meteorite impact around five million years ago created numerous crater lakes in the Pamir. Karakul is the biggest of them. At this altitude, 4,000 meters above sea level, there is hardly any life. The Black Lake lies in a lunar landscape. From one country to another, the border between Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan is a watershed. Scenery also changes. In Kyrgyzstan, the valleys are broader and the pastures greener. Instead of yak sand goats, there are herds of horses everywhere. What we know of Kyrgyz history is always associated with horse breeding and mounts of great staying power. In Soviet days, however, the attempt was made to get the Kyrgyz to change their nomadic ways. Today, nearly every family keeps a herd, even if they have other jobs and professions. Horses as far as the eye can see. They're sold for high prices, either as animals for riding or as meat delicatessen produce. One of the biggest horse populations can be found here along the Song Kul, a 280 square kilometer large freshwater lake in grassland at an altitude of 3,000 meters. Next to Lake Songkul, equestrian sports can be seen which used to be common in Central Asia. The focus is on the riding skills of young men as they battle for possession of a sheep or a goat. Whichever rider manages to pick the animal off the ground is chased. It's a situation shepherds here often experience. An animal gets lost, is stolen or killed. It then has to be recovered through skill and horsemanship. A goat is valuable. It is worth nearly a hundred dollars, a lot of money here in the grasslands. In Kyrgyzstan, there are professional teams wearing armor who perform in arenas and earn lots of money. But whether it is there or here by Lake Songkul, the best rider earns respect and is ready to tell a new story about the origins of the game. Originally, the game began with a wolf. A wolf was pulled to and fro on a horse and in the end thrown at the feet of rich men. That is why the game is known as Blue Wolf. The riders then lifted it up and put it in a huge vat made for boiling horse meat. Travelling through Kyrgyzstan is easier and faster than travelling through Tajikistan. The Pamir lies behind us and the infrastructure is decidedly modern. Isik Kul is the world's second biggest freshwater lake. There is tourism here and a lakeside cultural park which calls for tolerance towards many schools of thought and religions. The pavilion in honor of Chinggis Aitmatov is a particular magnet for visitors. In view of the many conflicts in Central Asia, people here are in search of visions and perspectives. In this respect, particular importance is attached to Chinggis Aitmatov. As the curator of the park, 
Aizada Yuma Kadirova explains. Describing Aitmatov's novel, Jaimilya, Louis Aragon once wrote, I swear that this is the most beautiful love story in the world. And reading Aitmatov's works is so exciting. In my opinion, his works are of educational importance. They point out the right path. Take the story of Mankurt in the novel, The Day Lasts More Than a Hundred Years. Mankurt stands for people who've been humiliated, mentally enslaved, and no longer have any will of their own. Mankurt was also a symbol of Stalinism. Sadly, this figure, which was created by Agmatov, is still to be seen today. We live in the modern era. New technologies are emerging and many correlations are being turned upside down. In these times, people have to be careful not to become a mankurt. In other words, they must not forget their own history and culture. Genghis Aitmatov also said, the hardest thing for a human being is to stay a human being with each new day. And that is something we human beings, all of us, should think about. Standing near the Aitmatov pavilion are sculptures which describe aspects of his conception of man and which seem to have lasting significance. Aizada Yumakadirova interprets the works of art for visitors and school classes. This statue represents Boston, the man in the novel The Scaffold, in the face of a she-wolf grieving over her lost cubs. The nymph on the child's head signifies that offspring are sacred to parents, irrespective of whether we are talking about humans or animals. In this work, Aitmatov describes the relationship between people, animals and nature. His most important message is that the offspring of both humans and animals is sacred for all creatures. Along with sculptures of philosophers and scientists, the park also contains the symbols of all world religions. Christian, Jewish, Islamic and Buddhist symbols stand for religious tolerance. Not something to be taken for granted these days, but a fitting message after a journey through Central Asia on the Pamir Highway.